Okay, let's jump into it. This week's episode of Wings Up Weekly, Tennessee Tech Athletics' new video podcast. Not going to lie, I'm pretty fired up about this episode with our guests because any day you can talk about baseball. Well, that's just a great day. So we've got Tennessee Tech head baseball coach Steve Smith. Coach, great to see you. How are you? Doing okay. Uh, you know, just kind of trying to make as much use of all this off time uh, as we can. It's, uh, I know it's not enjoyable for anybody, uh, really, but it's, the, uh, it's where we are right now, and we're, we're trying to make as much use of it as we can. So one of the first things we like to do on the onset of each episode of Wings Up Weekly, get a sense and an update how that person's team is doing. So what can you tell us about the members of Tennessee Tech Baseball? Well, uh, having just gotten their grades back, uh, I think they've been doing a fairly good job of, of handling the online classes. And for many of them, that was a new experience. Some of them had already been doing some online, so it wasn't as big a deal. But there was, you know, there was some angst going into that, I think, as to how guys would handle that. Um, I think they've handled it extremely well looking at the grades. Um, you know, everybody – maybe with the exception of four or five guys have been at home. Uh, so what they're doing and how they're handling that is kind of difficult to know. Uh, in my conversations with them, it seems like uh, there's a plethora of homemade gyms. Uh, it sounds like guys have figured it out, uh, you know, in terms of their own situation, whether it be in a garage or somebody else's garage, they're, they're figuring out how to, how to continue to get stronger and stay in shape. Um, some of them are on campus, and I'd be lying. They, they come in and out. When I've been in the office, which, you know, has not been a lot, uh, but I've been some, uh, it's not unusual to see four or five of them walking in and out. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're anxious. They're ready to go. Um, from a coaching standpoint, this has been a, a really – concentrated, very concentrated period of recruiting uh, in, a, in a very different environment. I mean, it's an incredibly different experience trying to recruit people that you've personally never seen and you can't shake their hand to a place that they've never seen uh, in person. And so, you know, everybody, <clears throat> you know, I find that we're all kind of recruiting each other a little bit in the dark, but uh, it, it's been, I mean, I've enjoyed it. it it's, it's to, to put a, you know, maybe a little bit of an analogy, it, we feel like a little bit of a major league expansion team right now. Uh, we're going to have quite a bit of turnover on our roster. So, uh, you know, I expect we'll, 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 at the end of the day, we'll probably see 14 to 15 new guys. So, you know, with the NCAA granting an extra year of eligibility across the board uh, in NCAA to NCAA baseball players, the NCAA portal, which is the, the, the avenue that they use to let everybody know they, they're looking to transfer, that has almost been like a waiver wire. It, it, it's almost like, um, you know, I go, to the, I go to the portal almost daily to see – if there's anything new, any new players, go from, you know, go get that guy's name, go to his institution's website, look at his numbers, see what position he is first, if he's somebody that we really, that position may be of interest. And then we, we go, you know, we've got a, a program called Synergy, which is pretty common in, in college athletics now, particularly in basketball and baseball, which is like a warehouse of video. Uh, of everything that – every game that's been televised, webcast, everything. And so, you know, you're sitting there and you're, you're finding players that are in the transfer portal. You go identify the position. Then you go to, uh, the, the, to Synergy, to the video, and you make a decision, and then you contact them. And game on then. It's, uh, you know, you're acquiring players. Well, a lot of great stuff there in terms of what the program's been up to. I'd like to go back to when all of this first occurred. 
Tennessee Tech baseball played in the last game for the Golden Eagles throughout the department. There was a midweek game against Lipscomb. Then on, that was a Wednesday, looking to a Friday was going to be the OVC home opening series against Austin P. But then on that Thursday, kind of everything changed. What do you remember most about that time period and maybe that day specifically? Well, I think about a week ahead of that, um, I, I think we, we began to understand the possibilities that that, that would occur. Uh, I think the first thing that, uh, my first reaction was actually when the NCAA canceled the College World Series. And I, I can't remember the time frame if that was before or after that particular Thursday. But clearly when that happened, that got everyone in college baseball's attention, uh, good and bad. Uh, what I remember about that particular day was, you know, just the unusualness of it. It's a, it's, it's a historic, this is not anything any of us have been trained for really. Uh, and you're going to have to call a meeting together and you're going to be able to give them a lot of information, none of it very good. They're going to have a lot of questions for which you're not going to have hardly any answers. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's just a moment where um, the, the situation is bigger than baseball. Uh, you know, as, after I got to, after we had the first meeting and we sort of dispersed, you know, when they dispersed the first time, it was spring break and spring breaks were being extended two weeks, you know, to see what the situation would be. Uh, and it was after, it was during that period of time that it became evident that this wasn't going to, there wasn't going to be a resumption. Uh, and so I began to think of it like when I was a player, you know, I had an, I had an occasion during my, during my playing days, where I actually couldn't play for about 17 months because of an injury. Uh, and during that period of time, uh, I, I, at some point I began to think I might not ever play again. But I remember this, and, and, and I, I looked at opportunities like that. When, a, when an athlete is not allowed to do what he wants to do, then he's got to look for things to do that will make him better, that will prepare him for when the day comes that he is able to go. So I'll give you an example. I mean, in my life as a player, most of my injuries uh, were throwing injuries. So if I couldn't throw, if I, if I was in a situation where I really couldn't work on upper body, then I was gonna work on lower body. There's gotta be some way, you have to be able to find some way to take advantage of the opportunity uh, and not look at it you know, as, a, as, as, that, as an obstacle, but look at it as an opportunity. So I shot this question out and I, and I, I think I brought it up at that meeting. Uh, I hear players all the time. We hear people all the time that will say, almost casually, they'll say, well, things happen for a reason. You know, anytime something undesired happens to us, we, we want to just casually think, well, everything happens for a reason. Well, Yes and no. Um, I, I personally believe that that we get to decide our response to a situation, our response to something negative happens. When something negative happens, it sort of determines, you know, the whether the reason for it or not. And so I kind of threw out four possibilities to them. Uh, I did this on a on a text to them to all of them, and I said, you know, I know you guys think things happen for a reason, but, and maybe they do, but what about this? Maybe this is an opportunity for you to focus on academics. Maybe that's the reason. Maybe it's an opportunity for you to focus on a relationship within your own family, because you're obviously going to be at home. Uh, maybe it's an opportunity to look at your own game, your own, your own abilities, and focus on, on a weakness, something that you, 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 you don't get to work on at, at this extensive. And then I said, maybe it's just an opportunity to have a conversation with God and, 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 maybe, and maybe get more intimate with that relationship than you've ever been. And at the end of it, I just said, how you respond, you know, 
to the situation is going to determine what the reason was. Uh, that's, that's what I remember the most about that time. Coach, I really enjoy hearing your perspective on all of this and, and kind of what student athletes and coaches can work on during this time. I go back to a video that, that you put out on Twitter about a month ago. One of the things that you said, baseball players, coaches, athletes in general are able to deal with setbacks or used to setbacks, used to interruptions, used to bad things happening. It's part of their lives. When I heard that, I immediately thought of an old baseball cliche, how you're considered a great hitter if you fail seven out of 10 times. The nature of sports and, and being able to manage and deal with these failures was such a, a unique perspective and was comforting to know that throughout this situation, at least from an athletic perspective, that kind of everyone was going to be okay. Exactly. You know, Augie Garrido, um, who has passed away now, was – longtime coach at Fullerton and then finished his career at the University of Texas um, and who I got to know and, and really valued um, his encouragement to me and his friendship. He said something uh, one time that, that speaks to what you just mentioned to me. We all have heard that baseball is a game of failure. Augie made this statement one day, says baseball is not a game of failure, it's a game of opportunity. And, you know, Perspective is everything. Perspective is everything in life. Perspective is certainly a huge part of dealing with the ups and downs of baseball. You know, there's a, there's a term that I've learned uh, that I think relates to perspective, and it's just called reframing. You know, how, how you look at something is more important than what you're actually looking at. That's a, that's, a, that's a lesson probably in every sport. It's a lesson in – you don't have to be an athlete to learn that lesson. But it is a, an incredible life lesson that, that goes beyond our time as athletes, and, and we just have to learn it. It's just perspective. How you look at things is way more important than what you're looking at. You know, and, and, and how do you, what, what do you basis, what's your basis for reality? You know, when you're looking at something, what is your, what's the lens are you looking at it through? For me, and for many people that I've met in Cookville, they, they, look, at, they look at life through the lens of faith. And, and when they do that, they, they believe really two things. Their faith tells them that God loves them. And their faith tells them that God is good. And so, you know, and, and tragedy, I mean, this is not, I mean, this has been a tragedy for many people when, I mean, there's some upwards of 80,000 people that have died in the United States now. That's tragedy. That, that, that people, extended family, wives, all the, all the family members, that's tragedy. Um, if you don't look at that through the lens of faith, I don't know how you really manage it. Uh, you know, so far that kind of that kind of tragedy hasn't struck my family. Um, you know, it just hadn't hit us that hard. We're missing a few baseball games. Um, life's going to go on, uh, but you do you do have to look at it through whatever your whatever your lens of reality is. Mine's mine is the reality of faith. Well, coach, you, you kind of brought up you personally and that's where i'd like to to ask you it's been an unparalleled and unprecedented time for all of us i look at your timeline though you get hired as the head coach at tennessee tech at the end of december right around the holidays you have to move to cookville the end of january the meet <clears throat> in the eagle's nest then all of a sudden the season starts in mid-february 15 games in, it gets stopped and canceled. I've got to believe this has been upwards of sort of the, the wildest few months for you and your family personally. Yeah, and it's, it's, you know, primarily my wife, just my wife and I now. We've got an older son in North Carolina working in football there. So, you know, he's gone through the same kind of shutdown that we've gone through. Um, our younger one is married and living still in Waco and working at a church. They've been shut down from what's normal for them. So one of the things that, that this has afforded our family is more time together. 
especially with, with Ryan at North Carolina. He, he left North Carolina with his dog and his laptop and was in Waco for three weeks with his brother. And then he was back with us for about two or three weeks before he went back to North Carolina. Those are great. Those are, those are opportunities. And as a parent, you know, who's, you know, our families, we've always been really close. Uh, I mean, when you, when you're a coach and your boys grow up playing the game and you wind up coaching them. I mean, I never, I never experienced the normal feelings of a parent sending their kid off to college uh, until after I was fired at Baylor and we had to leave. And one stayed at Baylor and one transferred to Louisville. And, and that's when I started feeling more of that normal, you know, pain of separation. That's one of the things that's, that's helped during this period of time is we're all going through it together and we've been closer. Heck, we've played, we played some family games uh, on Zoom, um, you know, with, with those boys and when they were in Waco together and Melinda and I are sitting on a couch somewhere and we're, we're actually playing games together. That was pretty cool. Um, the coaching part of it, <laughs> you know, let's face it, um, the program is, is, is in a bit of a uh, transition. Um, you know, Matt Braga being there 14 years, that's a lot of, that's a lot of continuity. It's unusual. Uh, it's good. Uh, he, he finished his 14 years at Cookville on a very, very high note. Uh, matter of fact, two or three years of a very high note. And then after 18, he, he takes another opportunity. And then a, I want to say it was 9, 10, 11 players. You know, the, the, virtually the entire team that was playing, they're gone. A couple of the key guys, particularly on the mound of, from those uh, 17 and 18 teams, had some pretty significant injuries, throwing injuries. Uh, so that's the situation. You know, the new coach takes over. He's fighting through the 2019 year, which I don't know how anybody could have expected that to have been really good coming off of that many losses in 18. They have a losing year in 19. Obviously, you have a change in, in leadership. And like you mentioned, you, you come in, you know, like mid-year almost, mid-season. And, uh, and there's just a lot of uncertainty. Um, Fortunately, I think the, the most positive thing about it was the two remaining assistants, uh, Mitchell Wright and Garrett Walters. I, I think they're two young guys. You know, Mitchell in his maybe third year as a full-time coach in Division One baseball. Uh, Garrett, you know, cutting his teeth as a volunteer. Uh, those guys held it together. And so when I walked through the door, the players were um, – the players were on a on a on a discipline level and on a I would just call it a class level. They had had good models. Um, you know, I don't I didn't even have a meeting about rules. Um, I actually talked for for you know probably a week daily just about the term respect. And I think I was sort of using this guys and using this opportunity, knowing that it was you know this was a just jumping in in the middle of a year, I sort of was, I wanted to test some things. And so I didn't give them a rule. We just talked about respect. We talked about respecting those above us, below us, beside us, respecting those that were before us. And I wanted to see if, if we just could all come to an agreement about what that was, what respect meant, and then just let it roll and just, and just really hold ourselves accountable just to that. And if you did that, Maybe you didn't need rules. Maybe you didn't need a lot of thou shalt nots if you will just, you know, be respectful. And honestly, I don't, I don't think we had, you know, a bump in the road. I was never tested. I mean, nobody ever, no, we never, I was never tested. Nobody ever pushed the envelope and, I, and, and you know, to say, well, I wonder what coach really meant about respect. Um, nobody did that. Then we started playing. Now, you know, the first weekend was, was exciting. The first weekend was, was productive. I, I, one of my – a memory that I have clearly is the Sunday game 
uh, the Sunday game of the opening weekend, uh, we were playing a run rule, which meant that if, if one team was ahead by 10 after the completion of seven innings, then the game would be over. That's not uncommon, particularly on days where you've got travel. So, you know, instead of playing for another hour, you know, people can get on the road. So we were playing that Sunday game on a run rule. Well, you know, here we were in the top of the seventh inning against Evansville. They were ahead 10 to two. And they had a couple of guys on and I'm looking down in the bullpen and there's really not another guy to throw. And I wasn't that worried about it. I sat there and I thought, you know what? This thing's fixing to be over. Um, and I won't need to, I, won't, I don't have another arm. I won't have to, to push somebody further than they needed to be pushed. It'll, it'll work out. Well, somehow or other, we got out of that seventh inning, 10 to two. The next inning, I think we hit a, you know, a two run home run or a three run home run. We cut that lead down. We got through the eighth inning. And then we go into the ninth inning and we're down by three runs. And obviously this is my first games in that ballpark. But so far, it, it felt like we were playing basketball more than we were playing baseball. And I literally had the thought, you know, this is a one possession game. I mean, we were down by three. I said, this ain't a big deal. This is a one possession game. And you know what? Um, they brought in a new guy. Uh, he gives up a two strike base hit, a walk. They bring in another guy. Um, we pinch hit. We, pin, we got a pinch hit, uh, three-run home run uh, uh, by Nate Jones. True freshman, you know, he came in and faced their left-hander, who was their best guy out of the bullpen. They went to their best guy with two guys on and nobody out. And we hit an opposite field, three-run home run to tie that game. Uh, and then Henchman came up. I mean, it was over. I mean, I, I mean, it was over. I knew it was over. And, you know, their guy threw about six sliders in a row and Hinchman finally got one and hit it out of the park. So, you know, the other coach, this is the last thing I'll say about it, the other coach, when we shook hands at home plate, I mean, bless his heart, he, you know, he was just trying to get out of town with a win. He is two runs away from ending this game in seven innings and he loses it. And I just shook his hand and I said, hey, buddy, I said, the good news is you don't have to play here anymore. I said, the bad news is I got to play the whole year because it's such an offensive park that you're never, you're never out of it. And as a coach, you like to feel pretty good about being up by eight runs, you know, in the seventh inning that you got this one in hand, but you really don't. Um, but we weren't off, you know, we won those three and then what did we do? We lost the next 12. And, and, uh, Dylan, I mean, honestly, I don't wish the coronavirus had stopped anything, but we had our season was mercifully ended. Mm. And I don't say that. I, I hate to say that. I don't say that. Uh, maybe I shouldn't say that, but I, I'm I'm just being honest. And um, and so I, I got enough of the. I got enough of a look to know what the strengths were, what the weaknesses were, what direction we had to go, how bad was it? Uh, what I didn't get that would have been really valuable is a look at the whole league. Um, we only played one conference series against Edwardsville, so that's the only other club I saw. You know, I've had experience in the past playing some of the other teams. I've played Murray, played Jacksonville. So I, I know I know a little bit about what it is, but um, honestly, I was ready. Uh, it's, it, you, if you play golf, you'll understand this. So what do you want to do if you're, if you're halfway through the front nine and you're already eight over? <laughs> it's kind of uh, – you, you want to put the, the clubs in the bag. I want to end it. You want to start over. Yeah. You want to call it a day and you want to start over. That's what this was. We were, you know, a fourth of the way into the season and – for all intents and purposes, it was done. So, 
I feel for the whole community of college baseball. I feel for some of our seniors who probably will never play again, but for the bigger picture of Tennessee Tech baseball, uh, I'd be less than honest if I didn't say it to you. I thought it was a blessing. Well, Coach, I enjoy hearing you talk about that Evansville game and talking about baseball and, and what you remember most. We've heard about from the coach, Steve Smith. What I kind of want to hear about is the player, Steve Smith. You were a fifth-round draft pick of the San Francisco Giants, made it all the way up to AAA. While you were at Baylor, led then called the Southwest Conference one year with a 172 ERA. Coach, it sounds like you were a pretty good pitcher. Um, you know, according to some of our guys during BP, I still am. <laughs> it's still cutting on me. You know, I, um, I was a high school football, baseball player. I grew up in South Mississippi, which at that time was, you know, the state of Mississippi is, is maybe per capita. I've got a lot of pride in my home state. I'll just go ahead and say that up front. But I think the state of Mississippi, in terms of NFL players, leads the country per capita. I mean, there's something on the on the 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 number of two or three million people in the star state of Mississippi. So it's a small state, you know, population-wise, with a lot of NFL players. So I grew up in a football mindset. But the one thing I could do my whole life was throw, and I love. I mean, I love the fact that I had the ball in my hand. I loved to compete. I loved it. And so almost, I loved it too much, actually. I, I loved to throw so much that, that my career was shortened, really, just by throwing too much and not really having a, a good plan on how to take care of my arm. Uh, but when I went to the Southwest Conference, I was a transfer from a Division II school uh, where I had played football and baseball for a year. And I decided after that, I, I, I knew football wasn't, I wanted to find out how good I was. I wanted to know if I was any good as a baseball player. I had been plenty good at division two. So now I'm gonna go division one. The school that I, I had gone to as a, as a, in division two was Mississippi College, which is small. It was in the Gulf South Conference. Back then UT Martin was in the Gulf South Conference. Um, Troy, Valdosta, Jacksonville, a lot of these members now that even are in the OVC uh, were in that, were Division II at that time. So I played football against them, played baseball against them. Uh, but I wanted to know if I was any good. Well, Mississippi College was a small, private, Christian, Baptist school. None of that had anything to do with my original reason for going there. My original reason for going there is I still wanted to try to play both and I couldn't do that division one. Uh, so I went there for a year, but I fell in love with that school. My faith grew, uh, I found a home there. And so at the time I was thinking about transferring, Baylor University was really just a larger version of Mississippi College in terms of a school. They had been in the College World Series, back to back years. So I thought, okay, I love Mississippi College. I'll probably love Baylor. Now it was 600 miles from home. I didn't love that. Uh, they played in the same league with the University of Texas and Texas A&M. So I thought, I'm going to find it. If I go there and I can play, then I'll find out how I'll find out something. If I go there and I'm not good enough to play, I will find out something. And that's really all I wanted to know. I just wanted to know at the end of the day. I can look myself in the mirror, and this is who I was as a player. So that's what I did. I transferred. I was a walk-on. I sat out a year. Uh, that was the longest year of my life. To be quite honest with you, the feeling I had that year transferring to Baylor where I wasn't able to play, that's what this has felt like in Cookville. I haven't found a home in Cookville yet. People have asked me, have you, have you moved? Well, yes, yeah, sort of. We've, we've got rented furniture and we're in an apartment, but I can't find a home until I find some players. It was the same thing when I went to Baylor as a player. I was miserable. I was miserable until the day they said, here's the ball. And, the, and I got to play. That took over a year. I, and my prayer is that it ain't gonna take over a year, you know, as a coach at Tennessee Tech. But it's a similar situation 
for me, you know, right now. But once I got to play, um, it was uh, it was the period of time in the Southwest Conference when Roger Clemens was at Texas. Uh, Doug Drayback, who I had actually played with in the summer, was at the University of Houston. Some of these names, you know, people if they're if they're my age will remember some of these guys. Norm Charlton, uh, I, you know, that was I, I can't tell you what it felt like to be that kid from South Mississippi to have gone out there, transferred out there, walked on out there, sat out for a year, spent a year and a half before I got to play, and to be on the same field with those guys and actually be successful. Uh, and then a year later, uh, you know, to get a phone call that I'd been drafted by the Giants in the fifth round. I'm, I'm getting a little tingly just thinking about it right now. It was, um, you know, it, it was a, a, a very – big moment for me. Um, I never, I did not, when I transferred to Baylor to play, to find out how good I was, I never thought, I didn't think about the fact I might marry a girl from Fort Worth, Texas, that I would meet literally in orientation when she was transferring, I was transferring. We met in orientation, uh, didn't date, for over a year, I would pass her in the sidewalk in between classes and we would talk for a minute and that was it. And we've now been married 36 years uh, and got two boys. She wound up being a cheerleader at Baylor. She transferred to Baylor from a junior college and became a cheerleader. I transferred from a, a D2 school and wound up being a, a starting pitcher in the Southwest Conference. So, you know, and then you just, just to jump on ahead of the story, to go back there as the head coach for 21 years, um, you know, it's just, there's just a whole, whole lot of stuff there, you know, a whole lot of stuff. Um, and, but this is where I am now, and this is where the Lord's brought us. And uh, in some ways it's like starting over, but in some ways it, it's like a, Maybe it's a little bit of an interlude. Maybe it's a pause in, 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 this, in the book. Um, but I know one thing. I, the one thing I, I haven't lost any zeal for, I haven't lost any zeal for recruiting. I haven't lost any zeal for coaching. And darn sure I haven't lost any zeal for winning. And uh, that's not going to matter where I am. Coach, I loved hearing that story and hearing you pitching at Baylor and then getting the call from the Giants. What I would love to hear – is there a game on the mound that sticks out to you that you pitched in? Maybe a, a no-hit bid, maybe a matchup against Roger Clemens, a game from college, a game in the minors. Is there one in particular that would stick out to you? You know, um, not so much a game, but there was a period of time. Uh, I started off really, really good in professional baseball. Um, I went to, to the Pioneer League in Great Falls, Montana, and my first summer out, I was eight and three. I threw about 90 innings. I did some things. They would never in a million years do this in professional baseball today. I had a, I had a 10 inning complete game in rookie ball. Most guys that go out today, you know, that have come out of college, especially, they've got innings limits. They, they're not gonna throw a complete game, period. Well, I had one that was 10 innings. Um, my first complete game win in professional baseball was something like a 13 to seven game in Helena, Montana. Now who, who finishes, how many pitches were thrown? I mean, when I hear pro guys talk about pitch counts, how many pitches did I throw <laughs> in a nine inning game on the road uh, that I gave up seven runs, <laughs> struck out, a dozen, walked a couple. I mean, how many? I mean, that's, you can, a lot. Not, that's a lot of pitches. And again, that has that plays into a little bit about what happened going forward. But but I went out of that that year. I threw ninety two or three innings, struck out one hundred and seven, and walked sixteen. So I got into such a groove. I didn't walk anybody, and I was throwing almost all fastballs. The, the teams in that league were a little bit – some of them were almost all high school guys. Some of them were a, 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 a 
a blend of college and high school, but, you know, they were all trying to swing wood bats for the first time and, you know, and none of them had been to the Cape. All right. So you're, you're throwing balls by them a lot, but two years later, uh, that was 83 in 1985, I was at Fresno, California in a ball and we were midway through the season. It's right at the all-star break. It's, it's, it's right about the time the draft had happened and you're starting to get a few new guys coming in from the draft. My record at that time was 0-5 with a 7-plus ERA. I had never, never, I, I, my confidence was, it, it was as low as it could be. And I got called into the office at that point. And now up until that point, I'd been pitching out of the bullpen, which I had never done before. And... So every time I went in, something went wrong. And I wound up with an 0 and 5 and 7. So I got called into the office during that midpoint, and I thought I was about to be released. I, I mean, I just, that's exactly what I thought. I, there's new guys coming in every day. I thought I'm going to get released. I went in there, and the, the farm director was in town, and he looked at me and he said, You're not going to get released. We're going to put you in the rotation, and you're going to stay there the rest of the year. Um, you know, okay, that's good, but it still didn't change the fact that you're 0 and 7, or excuse me, 0 and 5 with a 7 and change ERA. So to your question about do I remember something, what I remember is this. I remember going out, uh, and it, it was in uh, Salinas, California, uh, you know, close to Monterey, close south of San Jose, cold over on that side of the coast. And, and I was, I started this game and it's the only time in my life that whatever the pit, whatever the catcher put down, I threw it. I didn't shake. Matter of fact, I didn't shake for a long time. I, I simplified the game. I, I got my mind out of it and I just tried to execute pitches. And little by little, I won a five inning game, got that, got that win. Uh, by the time the season had ended, uh, I was eight and six. Uh, we had won the league. I had pitched the division championship game. Um, I was somewhat back to normal, which meant I might not throw what you call. <laughs> but I will never forget it because it has helped me coach. You know, if if you've never – almost every pitcher that I've ever coached has, has struggled at some point. I really had never struggled like that. I never until that time. And I mean, that was, I was 0 and 5 with 70 RA in a ball. And so when I've had guys struggle, one of the first go-tos I have for them is simply to simplify. It's just simplify. Let's just execute like we're in the pen. All right, get you, you know, put, let your mind rest. Uh, most pitchers don't like that. Most, mo well, most pitchers in my era, they called their own game and they were in charge and that's what they did. Today, a lot of kids come up and they've never called a game, so they don't even understand what you're talking about. But I can at least relate to what the guy's going through. Um, I I'm going to give you one more. A year before that, uh, in 84, I got sent from double A down to A ball for the first time. And I had pitched a couple of times. I was coming back from an injury and I was still at that point in time viewed as a prospect by the organization, which means they don't want to mess with you. They'll tell the pitching coach, wherever you are, don't, don't do anything with this guy. Just let him, let him pitch. Well, I had done that. I was in Fresno, California and my pitching guy there was a guy named Marty Demerit and Marty, he came to me and he said this, he said, look, they told me not to mess with you, but I just want you to know if you don't make some changes, you're going to hurt yourself. Well, what do you do? You know, I, so I listened to him. I said, what do you, what do you want me to do? Well, at the time it was, it was a mechanical change. It was something about where I was breaking my hands. And so I worked on it with him a couple of times in a bullpen everything was great. Um, then I had to pitch. And I'm in Modesto, California, and I'm pitching against a lineup that's got Mark McGuire and Jose Canseco in the middle of it. They're both in A ball. 
I will also add that they, they weighed a lot less then than they did when they got to the big leagues. And it's the only time in my life ever that I did not get out of a first inning of a game. Every time I was in the middle of my windup and that place where I was trying to change, where I was breaking my hands, that's what I was thinking about. Mm. So I, 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 you can't think about body parts and think about the mitt and focus on the mitt at the same time. That scarred me. That, that, that lesson has scarred me as a coach. You know, I am not going to talk body parts with a pitcher. I will give him what, what, is, what I would call an external cue. You know, if you're, if, you're, if you're missing high and away on the arm side, let's change your sights. Same thing you do in golf. Maybe the same thing you got to do hunting sometime if the wind's blowing real hard. But you just change your sights. You don't start focusing on the body because once you do that, you're done. Those are the two experiences that I had as a player, being that bad, 0-5 with a 7, and then going out there and not getting out of the first uh, in Modesto because of, you know, paying attention to a body part. Those two things have impacted me more in coaching players, especially pitchers, than anything I've ever been through. Well, you, you bring up coaching and how that had the impact on coaching. You discussed Baylor and spending 21 years there, winning over 740 games, countless regional, super regional appearances, a bid to the College World Series. Some awesome players while you were there. I, I think of Jason Jennings, Golden Spikes Award winner, Kelly Shopik, Johnny Bench Award winner, maybe a little bit more recent, a uh, big league all-star, Max Muncy. You've had some just awesome players throughout your tenure when you were at Baylor. Yeah, that's uh, if you're going to be successful as a coach, that's what it's going to be. Um, you know, I, uh, Mitchell Wright has told me that Matt Braga uh, was of the opinion that he could take anybody and make them into a good player. So he didn't recruit much. Matt didn't really recruit. Everybody else recruited, and he just – whatever you brought to him, he would, he would make into a good player. If Matt Braga can do that, hats off to him. Steve Smith can't do that. All right. Uh, you got to, you know, I think the, the, you better be able to find some good players. Those guys you mentioned, those, they were great players. Uh, there were a bunch of others. Um, I think my job as a coach, uh, you know, you're, 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 you're really doing, you're running two different operations at the same time. You, you've got, on the coaching side, you've got player development. And on the, on the other side, on the acquisition side, you've got uh, the scouting department. So it's in college baseball, you have one group of men, coaching staff, doing both of the things that on the major league level, you have two separate departments for. At the major league level, the scouts go find the really good players, and then they turn them over to player development. If these guys don't, if they don't become good players, these guys are yelling at these guys. They think they're stupid. If these guys on the, on the player development side don't like the guys that they brought in, they think the scouts are stupid. In college baseball, we don't have anybody to blame but ourselves. And so, you know, you better be pretty good at evaluation and knowing how you, you know, it starts with that. Um, you know, that's why, as I talked about earlier, the whole thing of doing this right now, you know, on a laptop, uh, looking at video without having to, you know, doing FaceTime calls and Zoom calls. And, you know, that's, that's not the way it's supposed to be done, but at least we got that. But, yeah, there was a lot of good players. I think in the time I was there, you know, you know, and, I, and I'm going to say this because I know it, I, the one thing I've learned at Tennessee Tech so far internally is, is how important academics are. Um, I mean, I, and, I, and I say this with, with um, I mean, I always, I mean, my mom was a teacher. Um, I mean, I've been, I've been the coach on the staff everywhere I've been, including at Baylor as a head coach. I've been the academic liaison. I wanted to know what guys were doing in classroom. I wanted to be the first phone call if something wasn't going right. I didn't want to hear it from somebody else. But the, the importance and the value placed on academics at Tennessee Tech um, is remarkable. 
And, and I appreciate that. And I think any parent, any parent would appreciate that. Uh, so when I went to Baylor, we had one in our history, had one academic All-American. I think when we left there, we had a dozen or more. And I'm just as proud of those guys. Um, you know, it's a bunch of great guys. I hate the way that it ended. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's hard. It's really, really hard to work for your alma mater. It's like working in the family business. Uh, and then, you know, you find out at the end of the day, you're not family. And that's just really hard. So, but I am very, very grateful and very, very blessed by those players and the relationships with those guys. That continues today. There are so many games you coached at Baylor. As a baseball fan and, and kind of reading about some of these games, there were three games for me that just like blew me away. How crazy they'd be if you're a fan, let alone a coach. There was a game in the regional against Rice where your team was down 9 nothing, going into the eighth, scored 11 runs over the final two innings to win that game. You had a 22-inning game against nationally ranked Houston. It was about seven hours. But the one that I'm sure sticks out to you is in the College World Series, elimination game against number one Tulane, down 7 nothing going into the bottom of the seventh, score eight runs over the next three innings, walk the game off in the bottom of the ninth, nationally televised game on ESPN. I mean, those are some just outrageous games. They are. Um, you know, and believe, but let me say this, um, and I appreciate you doing your homework and, and bringing those to mind that, that, that warms my heart to hear those because as a coach, you tend to not remember those. You tend to remember the ones, uh, where it didn't end up the way you wanted. Uh, I have a lot of, you know, I, I, I made some decisions, uh, that looking back on it, uh, you know, weren't the right decision to make. Um, that's one thing. That's one reason I'm I'm, I'm very fortunate. I'm, I feel um, I'm blessed to have this opportunity at Tech because I have been through so much, you know, and have made so many mistakes that I really wanted to have an opportunity to put that stuff to to you know to work. You know, that's one of the sad things about our life in general and coaching maybe and specifically is the older you get, you know, in baseball, you're almost seen as less valuable. Um, and I, I'm, I, I can promise that I'm, I am the best version of a coach I've ever been right now. And it's largely because of not just the successes, but really more, more so the failures. The, uh, the two lane game at Omaha, um, the, you know, the lesson in that game, really, uh, what, what do you do? What, what do most baseball teams do when they get way behind? It's just sort of the rule in baseball that you just play station to station. You don't make outs on the bases. You just got to you gotta do it that way. Compare that or contrast that to a football game and a team gets way behind. What do they do? They start putting it in the air. I mean, they, they get more aggressive. Uh, they, they've got to make something happen. You know, for some reason in baseball, we, you know, the book has said, you know, you get way behind, you shut down the running game, you know, you just, you know, you slow the game down. Well, I don't, this, this was that team, that team in 05, we hit about 285 as a team. We weren't a big offensive team. Uh, we had really good pitching. Uh, and we're down by eight runs and are down by seven. And we weren't going to hit a three run home run. So it didn't, it didn't do us any good if we got a couple of guys on to wait till somebody came up and scorched one in the gap or hit one out of the park. So the thing I remember about the game is running double steals. You know, and being close, and we could have been thrown out, and people would have been screaming if we'd have been calling out. And I remember I watched the, the replay of the game, and Harold Reynolds was uh, was doing the color for ESPN on the game, and, and Harold was just going, this is nuts. He was being very, very critical of, of the strategy. Now, the next day, he came and apologized and said, I just want you to know, I, you know, I, I understand what you're doing. 
But we won that game on a fake bunt slash hit and run um, that we just were making things happen. We just, you know, we, we couldn't sit back. Now, that very team had also had – we had come back in that same year in a, in a Big 12 game against Texas A&M. We were down eight to nothing in, like, the third inning of the game and won that game. And in both cases, we were the home team. We were the home team at Omaha. We got the last at bat. Listen, in, in baseball, you know, there's no free substitution. So if you take a pitcher out, he ain't going back in, and there's no clock. So you got to get 27 outs. And that's, as a coach, sometimes I hate that. I promise you the coach from Evansville hated it. If he could have, he would have taken a knee and run the clock out. But you got to get 27 outs. And, you know, you can't watch the school board. Um, you know, the, the Houston game, I, you know, we tied that game up. Jason Jennings hit a, hit a home run in the top of the ninth to tie that thing up. And it wound up going, uh, what did it go, 13 more innings, 12 more innings. Uh, it was like a six-hour game. Fortunately, it started at four in the afternoon. Um, you know, uh, the one at Rice, I'll tell you the back story on that one. That was, that was, we were down by a bunch. So that meant we, we were in a rain. It was during the NCAA tournament, and that game had been delayed. So we were at like 10 o'clock at night, all right? And it just appeared like this game, we're going to lose this game, and, the, and, the, and we were going to have to play right after this game. I mean, the, the way the bracket was, the next game is going to start when this game is over, even oh. though it was like 10 or 11 o'clock at night. So my catcher was Kelly Shopik. And I had decided in the, I think it was the eighth inning, that I was, he was, I was going to let him hit, and then I was going to get him out of the game uh, to rest him a little bit before we played the next game. Well, he made an out, okay? And we wound up getting the game, not tied, but getting it to within one in one run. If we wouldn't have done that, all right, I would have been – he came up and he wound up getting another hit that actually put us ahead and maybe, maybe he might have been the game-winning RBI in the ninth inning. And I was going to take him out of the game in the eighth, but I didn't have the opportunity. Maybe he got on base. Something happened. It kept me from taking Shopik out of the game. And it kept him in the game, and he wound up being a big factor. If I'd, have taken, if I'd have done what the coach book said to do, I'd have had him out of the game, and we'd have never won it. Those are scary things sometimes as a coach, to know what you, you would have done. And so I, I, those, are, those are memorable games. I appreciate you mentioning them. Coach, I, clearly I could hear you talk about baseball forever, for hours, and, and some of these stories. The one last thing I want to get to – is 2005 after the college world series the head coach of team usa and playing different parts of the country going to japan going to taiwan if you look at that roster and especially you with a pitching background having max scherzer david price sean doolittle i mean what was that experience like being the head coach of team usa in 2005 it was awesome now i'd, I'd done the pitching for team usa in 98 and that summer, there are different summers in USA Baseball. Some summers are what they would call championship summers where they're playing an event like the World Championships or the Pan Am Games. They're doing something. At that period of time, you had to do that to qualify for the Olympics back when baseball was still in it. The 05 summer was not a championship summer. So it was, it was the purest form of a tour that you could be. So we played that series in Japan. We played the series with, uh, with the Taiwanese. Um, we played the Italians. We played a bunch of other countries, but there was nothing on the line. I really regret that. It, I had nothing to do with it. It's just the way it fell. But those guys you just mentioned, I would have loved to have seen them matched up with the Cubans. I would have loved to have seen them matched up, you know, for a championship, you know, with Japan. But just the experience of being around them and to see those guys have had such extensive careers. Uh, and we're, we're talking 15 years right now, you know, since those dudes were 20 years old. So they're, they're talking about guys right now that are in their mid-30s 
that are major league all-stars that are, I mean, Scherzer was crazy. Scherzer was at Missouri when I was at Baylor. Um, I, you know, most foul-mouthed human being I've ever been around and a 32 ACT. I mean, those two things don't ever seem to mix, but they, they do with him. I mean, but I remember being with him towards the end of the summer. You know, all pitchers think they can hit, and, and Max wanted to hit. And I wanted him to stop cussing. So I made a deal with him. I said, I, I did this in front of – and his and his head coach at Missouri, Tim Jamison, was on the staff, so he was there. And I told, I told Scherzer, I said, if you can go 24 hours without saying this word, I will let you hit in the game tomorrow. <laughs> and, of course, the players that were gathered around, they looked at me and said, there is no way he can do that. Okay. Well, our game starts. He's sitting on the bench. Everybody's at the, at the fence except for Scherzer. He's sitting on the bench, and he's got his mouth taped. <laughs> he has taped his mouth so he won't inadvertently drop the proverbial word. And, you know, the next day, his own coach came to me, says, you can't, you can't take the chance of letting him hit in the game. If he gets hurt, he says, we'll never, we'll never play again. You know, we'll never coach again. And I, I didn't – I wanted to hit it. I mean, I, you know what, let's go. But those guys talked me out. So I let Scherzer take BP. He took about 40 swings and hit one out of the park. And then, believe me, then the, the, uh, the quarantine on his mouth came off and uh, he was back to normal. But I played him the next year when he was at Missouri. He was a junior at Missouri. And, and he was pitching against us at Baylor. We were playing there in, in Columbia. And I had my four-hole hitter at the plate. I had a guy at third base, all right, with like one out. Max got the two strikes on my guy. I thought there – I mean, I think like a pitcher all the time. My, this hitter is not hitting him with two strikes. He's not going to hit this slider. So I put on a two-strike squeeze. All right. And my guy got that squeeze bunt down and we scored that runner from third base. And Scherzer just stepped off the mound and he looked straight at me in the dugout. And I was just laughing. Now, I won that little battle, but he won the war. I think it was the only run we scored. Uh, but I, that's, I'll never forget that. It was, I mean, who, who squeezed bunts with two yeah. strikes? But you know what? Again, I'm kind of a analytical guy to my own fault sometimes. But what what do you what what's your chances? You know, what's the chances right on right you're hitting Scherzer's 85 mile an hour slider? Not good. So we did it and it worked. And I, I wish we'd have won the game, but but we didn't. Well, coach, this is great stuff. We'll have to wind down our time here on Wings Up Weekly. I'll let us conclude though with with a final word from you. What message would you have to, to Golden Eagle fans and, and Tennessee Tech kind of going forward through this uncertainty right now? You know, hang in there. Uh, a little bit about what I talked about earlier. I mean, it's going to pass. My dad, you know, my dad grew up, he was an only child. He grew up on a dairy farm. And he never, he played fast pitch softball. And, you know, he caught me until he got, you know, to where he couldn't. But he, he said things to me during my life with him. He's been passed away now for 25 years. But there were things he said to me that make a lot more sense to me now than, than maybe they did then. And, and, I, and, and they're really, they've really helped me. One was keep your highs low and your lows high. All right? Just don't get, don't get too high. Don't get too low. I mean, could there be anything better to learn for a baseball player than that? Because the baseball season is, is just a, it's a roller coaster. The second thing he said was to smell the roses along the way. And that's the thing I think I have the hardest to do. You've helped me do that today by reflecting back on some of those memorable games. But I promise you, when those games happen, as a coach, you, you're, you're on to the next game. You know, you just immediately get out of that. So one of the things I'm trying to do is learn how to smell the roses along the way and help players learn how to do that. And then the last thing he said 
and this is my dad was a champion of perspective. He just reminded me that this too shall pass. So it was keep your highs low and your lows high, smell the roses along the way, and remember that this too shall pass. That's the words my dad gave me that have gotten me through a lot of stuff, helped me understand things, helped me keep bright minded. That's what I would share with the tech folks. And I, I would also share, we're, we're loading up. We're gonna, we're gonna get this thing back. Um, I'm excited about the guys that are saying yes to us right now. I'm a lot more excited about them than I am the guys that are saying no. Um, I like the fact that this place attracts a certain temperament of guy, a certain work ethic of guy. Um, I like that. And I'm excited about getting to the field as soon as we can. Coach, that's awesome stuff. Really appreciate you joining us. Stay safe, stay healthy out there. And thanks again, Coach. Thanks, Dylan. Appreciate it. Enjoyed it. That's going to do it for another episode here of Wings Up Weekly.